Welcome to Demond Does the Six Questions, where the same six questions can tell a unique story. I am your host, Demond, father of two, husband of one, and leader of this here Demondcast. My guest has lived most of his life in Brooklyn. He's been married for over 30 years to a wife who, and I quote, lets me get away with far more than is good for me, which sounds familiar. His interests include old radio shows, classic pulps from the 30s and 40s, comic books, Star Trek, pop culture, science fiction, animation, television, and movies. Oh yeah, movies. Most importantly, he is the creator of one of my favorite characters, the adventurer known as Dylan. Please welcome author Derek Ferguson. <laughs> Hello, how are you doing? Oh, uh, fine. Thank you for that intro. It makes me sound a lot more impressive than I actually am. Thank you. You're still in Brooklyn, so how how's life treating you? Everything, everything's everything. How's the wife? Yeah, she's doing fine. We are hunkering down like everybody else in this year of the plague. But I mean, it's no problem for me to stay home because most of the things I like to do is inside the house anyway. So I have no problem with staying inside the house. Your day, your day to day hasn't changed that much, has it? I mean, like I realized a lot of people had to, especially people with children and stuff like that. They had to make serious life changes to this plague we are suffering under. My wife and I, because it's just the two of us. Our life really hasn't changed that much, you know, since we spent most of our time at home. Anyway, yeah. The only thing that we regret, the only thing that we regret is that we like taking uh, vacations in Florida and visiting family in South Carolina and Virginia and Georgia, and we can't do that. So that's really the only thing that's changed. Well, are you ready to answer a few questions for me? I am ready to answer any questions you want to put to me, sir. All so right. feel free. Mr. Ferguson, Get me with them. Mr. Ferguson, you are about to get hit with the six questions. Question number one. I've heard the answer to this one, so I'm going to add something to it. The original question was, when did you know you wanted to be a writer? Now, I, now I ask you this. Did you not, I, I want to say it was in middle school. I've heard you say in other interviews that you've always wanted to be a writer. But I remember a story specifically where I want to say it was in middle school that you started uh, writing a story. You didn't, you never, I've never heard specifics. That you passed around the class, and then when it got back to you, you wrote the next part of the story. Was that accurate? That is right on the button. In sixth grade, what I would do is that because I was bored with whatever was, you know, the teacher was teaching, but I was bored. So what I would do is that I would write these Edgar Rice Burroughs influence stories using my classmates as the main characters. And they would end up getting stuck in some lost land with dinosaurs and cavemen. And I would write on both sides of a sheet of loose leaf notebook paper. At the end of the second side, of course, I would write to be continued. And then it would get passed around the class and everybody would read it, including the teacher. And everybody would tell me what they liked and what they hated. And once I got that back, then I would write the next chapter. Immediately, your writing style was influenced by the pulps. I'm assuming they were cliffhangers at the end of every notebook page. Am I, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was my thing. Even back then, like our local PBS station, would show like cliffhangers on uh, Saturdays, you know, with Flash Gordon and Spy Smasher and Zorro's Black Whip and the Jungle Woman and all these other things. So I was pretty familiar with the form with the formula of how a Saturday morning cliffhanger worked. And for some reason, that just clicked with me. I said, "Oh man, I love that." I didn't know what it was called, had no idea what it was called. All I knew was that I, I loved it, and I said, "Okay, that's what I want to write." I was pretty accurate on this, so I had a I had a backup one that I've, ne <laughs> that I've never heard. That I haven't seen. Uh, I haven't heard. I don't. I don't know how many interviews you've done, but I've not heard the answer to this. So I'm curious if you'll give it to me. Okay. When, when did you know about Dylan as a character? Like, when did he start to form? I know he's been. And I describe him to my friends as if you took Doc Savage, James Bond, and Shaft and blended it all together and made, and threw some more awesome on it, it would be Dylan. So 
when did that character uh, idea first start to form and as he's evolved into what he is today? I got to go back to when I, when I saw my first James Bond movie in the theater, which was Diamonds Are Forever. And I saw that with my late father. To this day, Diamonds Are Forever. And, and mind you, I realize it is not the best Sean Connery James Bond movie, you know, but it is my favorite just for that reason, that it's the first James Bond movie I saw in the theater. And I saw it with my dad, who was also a big James Bond fan. He turned me on to James Bond because he would read books and then he would give them to me and then I would read them and then we would sit down and then we'd talk about them. So after we came out of seeing Diamonds Are Forever, I recall distinctly asking him how come there wasn't a black James Bond. And he said, well, when you get to be a writer, I guess you'll have to create one. So sometime around like the early 80s, I really started seriously thinking about creating a black heroic character that would exemplify a lot of the traits that I saw in classic pulp heroes such as Doc Savage and the Avenger and all these other characters who were white. Because in all of my travels trying to find a black pulp hero, I couldn't find one to save my life. Couldn't find one with a search warrant and a posse of bloodhounds. So... (laughs) So this was a character that I wanted to create that was in the mold of the classic characters, but up to date. Over time, after much trial and error, I came up with Dylan somewhere around like in the 1980s. As a matter of fact, the first Dylan novel, Dylan and the Voice of Odin, was actually written during the 1980s. I sent it out to a variety of publishers and agents, and I did get a nibble from one agent who told me that yeah, he could sell it, but I'd have to change Dylan to a white guy. Yeah, he told, yeah, he said, listen, I can sell this, but you got to change it to a white guy. And I said, nah, it's okay. There are some things that I don't compromise on, and that was, and that was the main one. I appreciate you sticking to your guns. That's awesome. When I was growing up, when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, I would have appreciated if I could have went to a bookstore and gotten a book about a character like Dylan and I couldn't do that but you know now there are Dylan books for young black men who I hope that would go and read them and enjoy them you know revel in his adventures the same way that they do with other characters such as Indiana Jones and James Bond and Tarzan and stuff like that the people you know they say well why is that such a big deal and I said well you know what when the only black character that comes to the mind of people when you talk about, oh, well, what's a great black character? And they say John Shaft. And Shaft was created, what, 50 years ago? Yeah. But you ask white people, you know, well, what's a great, you know, oh, well, we got Mike Hammer, we got Shaft, oh, not Shaft, <laughs> we got uh, Dave Bond, and, you know, we got, I mean, they've got a whole bunch to choose from. Hopefully Dylan is just my humble effort to kind of balance the scales a bit. Question number two. What do you wish you had known when you started out? What do I wish I had known? I wish I had known to take business courses so that I could have treated my writing as a business, which admittedly I have not done. (laughs) There are other writers who I admire a whole lot because they treat their writing as a business. And I think that... For any writer, when you start out, what you need to do is that you have to think, okay, well, is this going to be a career? Is this going to be a business? Is this how I'm going to make my living? And you should plan for that. See, I never planned for that. I, you know, I worked a day job. You know, I worked a regular nine to five like most people. And I only really started writing seriously with the intention of publication once I retired early due to health reasons. I've had two pulmonary embolisms. And after my second one, my doctor recommended that I kind of like take it easy. I retired early. And then, you know, my output, of course, increased. I've been writing all this time, by the way, because in the 80s, I was sending out novels and short stories the old-fashioned way by snail mail. I'd stick stories in an envelope and mail them out and have to wait till they come back, usually about like six to eight months later with a rejection. But that's the one thing that I wish I had done. I wish I had like sat down and went through the whole thing of writing out a business plan and all that other stuff that you're supposed to do. 
have you thought have you done it since you've uh have you thought, gone about gone back to that idea since you got started like have you rec- have you done it now or like i'm not sure why that popped in my head but i'm guess i'll go ahead and ask when did you nah. find when when did you nah. Did, <laughs> nah. i was gonna ask nah. when did i was gonna ask when did you find when did you build your business plan and it doesn't sound like you nah know. nah nah <laughs> haven't done it haven't done it haven't done it. you know why because i'm just having too much fun just writing fortunately i am in the position and again i have to thank my wife because when i went to her and i said well listen I want to stop working and I want to stay home and I want to write and stuff like that. And she said, yeah, sure. Fine. She said, you know, we're not eating macaroni and cheese five nights a week. You know, go ahead. That's why when people always ask me, they say, well, what's the one thing that a writer should have? I always say an understanding spouse. That's the first thing you need because if they're not going to support you in what you're doing, then you're going to run into a whole bunch of problems. You know, like I'm having too much fun now doing it. If I start treating this like a business, I don't think I would have as much fun. <laughs> it's worked for you so far, so that there's something to be said for that yeah. Your way. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, listen, it's working out for me, you know, like I said. You know what? Not a lot of people get the opportunity to write what they want to write. That's true. So I consider myself highly blessed in, in that I write whatever I want to write and people actually like it. And people actually are willing to pay good money out of their pocket to read it. I mean, hey, you can't ask for more than that as far as I'm concerned. How many people get to live out their dream? Ever since I was a kid, it was my dream to be a writer. And I am. You know, people read my stuff and they enjoy it. Question number three. What is your go-to order at your favorite hometown restaurant? Turkey wings and macaroni and cheese. Did you say turkey wings? Turkey wings. Yes, you heard me correctly, sir. I said turkey wings. Nice. Um, <laughs> so where do you get these? There is a restaurant on Fulton Street. What is the name of that restaurant? Now I just want to blank. But there's a restaurant on Fulton Street not too far from me here in Brooklyn. And it's a seafood place. But they also sell, like, other stuff, too. And one of the things that they sell is turkey wings. And I happen to love turkey wings. So at least twice a week, I'll go there. Oh, Duncan's. That's the name of the restaurant, Duncan's. And at least twice a week, I'll go there and I'll get like four or five turkey wings and a large macaroni and cheese. <laughs> now, that's weird. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> what I think, no, but what I say, turkey wings, people who people will give me the same answer that you just said. You said, Did you say turkey wings? I said, yeah. I just want to make sure, I just want to make sure I heard right because I look at him every Thanksgiving. I'm a I'm a leg man myself, but yeah, I was like, you know, I get that. That makes perfect sense. Oh, to I me. do. I do not wait for Thanksgiving, you know, <laughs> for turkey. I yeah, I eat turkey wings all all year long. Like I said, I kept my back on the turkey wings for for less. I had them yes a couple of days ago, and I will probably have one tonight because there's two more left in upstairs in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, so you're oh you're frequent then. Okay, got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what it is? Since it's just me and my wife, there's no reason for us to do like a whole lot of cooking. So a lot of times we will actually go to our favorite restaurant, get whatever we want, and you know, put it in the refrigerator. We eat off of that. You know, and now it's the summertime. Occasionally I'll go out and back and grill, you know, stuff like that. But like I said, since it's two of us, no, we don't do a whole lot of cooking here. <laughs> Question number four. What are you curious about? What am I curious about? The human condition. People and what they do and why they do it is a never-ending source of fascination for me. I should have been born a Vulcan because human beings, are, you know, I look at the stuff that people do and I just say, well, why did they do that? Or why did they say that? Or why did they think that? And I think that that comes with being a writer because when you're writing about people, you're writing about the things that fascinate you about people, why people do what they do. And well, if they're in this situation, how do I think that they would react? How would I would like them to react? How would I react in a situation like this? I think that that's what a lot of writing is, is working out emotional and psychological things that are bubbling around in your subconscious. Because with, cause I know that one of the most fascinating things is, is that I will write something 
and then people will talk to me or, you know, they email me and then they say, okay, well, this is what you, you know, what you were writing about. And I said, oh, man, I, I said, really? Is that what, like, you know, a lot of times I don't really know what I wrote about until somebody tells me what it's about. Yeah, I guess that that's the best answer I can give to that question. The human condition, just what it is to be human is intensely fascinating to me because everybody's different. And at the same time, we're all the same. When you say people ask you what it's about, do they mean like themes of the story? Yeah. Or is it something else? Oh, themes of the story. Because I'm not what you might call a theme writer. My thing when I sit down and write a story, my primary goal at the moment that I'm doing it is to entertain. But of course, there are things that slip in there without me knowing it because it's coming out of my subconscious, which I trust an awful lot while I'm writing. I trust my, I've, I've, I've told this to a few people before uh, that my subconscious is working all the time. You know, it never takes a break. And I imagine that my subconscious is this really twisted, ugly version of myself bent over, looks like a hunchback working in this warehouse that looks like something out of, I don't know, a David Lynch movie (laughs) and he's working all the time and he's constantly pissed off because he has to work all the time and I get to take a break and then he spits out these stories and I just take them and I transcribe them and I trust that he knows what he's doing because most of the time he does. If I sit down and try to, once he's done his job, then I step in and I do like the technical stuff to make it readable and that's what I do. But the meat and potatoes of the story That's his job. (laughs) That's what he does. He's putting in that stuff that I don't recognize, but other people do. They read that and then they say, okay, well, this is what this is about. And then I read it and I say, oh, you know something? You're right. Yeah, that is what it's about. (laughs) Question number five. Is there anything I should have asked but didn't? Oh, you should ask me about my movie reviews. Please. How did that start? Please tell me, A, about your movie reviews, and I know you you, you have done a podcast on movie reviews. Could you, could you make, uh, tell the people about that too, please? As a matter of fact, I'm on my second podcast, co-hosting a podcast about movies now. I did one for about seven years called Better in the Dark with a friend of mine named Tom DJ we reviewed movies and we talked about movies and we did that for like seven years. And then we just shook hands and decided to call it a day. Just recently I started doing another podcast with another friend of mine, Perry Constantine called superhero cinephiles, which is focusing on superhero movies. If you go listen to that, every episode is about the superhero movie day on B for Vendetta, which was good. Yeah. Which were, which, he picked because he thought that it would be a very timely movie considering what we're going through now. A little on the nose, yes. Yeah. If you're a superhero fan, which I know you are, and for anybody else that's listening, please, I advise you to go and check that out. Or and you can also go to the Ferguson Theater, which is my movie review site where I've written something close to like 400 movie reviews and they're up there now for you to read. So if you, there's been a lot of people that have actually told me since they've been quarantined, they've been making use of my movie reviews to find something to watch on the weekend. Make use of that as a resource as you will. So how did you get started doing movie reviews? You started uh, pulp writing when you were, you know, like officially pulp writing when you're in roughly sixth grade. Uh, so when did the movie review thing happen? It was uh, obviously it's two two hobbies for you just melding together like peanut butter and chocolate. But how did that come together? I have been a movie fan ever since I can remember. My parents used to like telling a story about me. They said that when I was a baby, they went to see the Ten Commandments and they took me. Said, but when they took me in the theater, they said, now other parents that had brought their babies, they had to take them out because they were crying. They said, but not me. They said I was just staring at the screen like I was hypnotized. That's probably the reason why to this day The Ten Commandments is my favorite movie. (laughs) Uh, 
I grew up watching movies with my parents. They turned me on to Western. My father was, the, my mother and father were big Western fans. My mother was a horror movie fan. So one of my fondest memories is she would wake me up at 1130 at 12 o'clock at night. You know, she would be my sister's asleep and she would wake me up. She said, come on, come on, come on. And we would watch Night of the Living Dead or What Have Happened to Baby Jane or Day of the Triffids. I grew up during the Grindhouse era, the great Grindhouse era. So I actually went to Grindhouses in Manhattan's 42nd Street. So a lot of the movies that people have seen just on home video, I actually went to the theaters. See, so I have a different perspective on it than I think that most people have. Okay, I got to wrap this up and get to the point of what you asked me. Uh, in in my circle of friends and family, I've always been known as the movie guy. So when people want to know something about a movie, they will call me up and ask me, well, should I go see this movie? Should I go see that? Patricia said, well, you know what you want to do? She said, you should just start writing down your reviews. And this way, when people ask you about it, you can say, okay, well, go read the review. So that's what I started doing. Eventually, like I said, it kept growing and growing and growing until now, like I said, I have 400 movie reviews of, of all different types of genres. I reviewed all of Star Wars movies. I reviewed all of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. This October, I want to do the Phantasm series because that's my second favorite horror movie franchise. I want to do all of the James Bond movies. Eventually, I want to do all the Fast and Furious movies. One of the main reasons why I started doing movie reviews is a way of tricking my brain into keep on writing whenever, first of all, I'm going to say the dreaded phrase, even though I don't believe in writer's block, but some people do. But let's say I'm working on a piece of fiction, and for one reason or another, I got stuck. Well, I don't want to just stop writing, because then it gets harder to get started. So then what I'll do is that I'll switch over and I'll write a movie review. And they're usually no more than about 2,000 words, something like that. And usually by the time I finish doing that, whatever has blocked me on the original piece of fiction, I can go back and I can continue to work on that. So movie reviews are also a way of tricking my brain into continuing to write and not getting seized up. No wonder your subconscious is mad at you because you every, <laughs> you write all the time, duh. <laughs> so, no, yeah, so pretty, pretty much. <laughs> so while you're consciously working on your, your movie reviews, your poor subconscious is like, oh, come on, man. I'm trying yeah. to get some rest here. That, oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a poor overwork squab. He smokes all the time. He drinks <laughs> bad booze. You know, and like I said, he works in his miserable warehouse, and he never gets he never gets a vacation, he never gets laid, he never goes out and parties. You know, he has no fun at all. He's just there constantly working on my stories for me. And you appreciate him, though, right? I love that guy to death. I <laughs> wish I could. I wish I could pay him, but hey, <laughs> I'm also cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Question number six. If you could create a new holiday, what would it commemorate? Oh, that's simple. Fast Reeves Day. Fast Reeves Day. <laughs> yeah, yes. Fast Reeves Day. Yes. Simple. Um, my listeners actually know a little bit about Bass Reeves because I did, uh, in the season finale, I did a piece on uh, Bass Reeves. But yes, those... I did. Yeah, I listened to it. Very good, sir. I enjoyed it immensely. Oh, oh, thank you very much. For the listeners who haven't listened to it yet, can you give them a, can you give a Bass Reeves elevator pitch? A Bass Reeves elevator pitch? Yeah, just give them, uh... the, yeah, just give them, the, give them the quick lowdown so they can get more of the details on that thing. Bass Reeves is quite simply the most celebrated lawman in the West that you've never heard of. He's captured more criminals, and his actual career reads like the stuff of something from a pulp novel, but it's actually true. An escaped slave, he runs away to the Indian Territory, and he learns how to trap. He learns how to shoot. And then he comes back, you know, to civilization, and he becomes a lawman under the authority of the famous hanging judge, Judge Parker, who makes him a lawman and sends him out with the mandate to uphold the law and clean up the West, <laughs> which is what he does. 
And for more about the incredible Bass Reeves, check out the season one finale. Yeah, I mean, okay, I have to go back to how I found out about Bass Reeves because I am of a considerable age, I would say. I was born in 1959. But in all the time that I've lived, I have never heard a single word about Bash Reeves. I did not hear about him until I was like in my, I must have been like in my 40s. Really? Or something like that. Really? And I heard, of, and wait a minute, I heard about him from a white man. No way. Ron, Ron Fortier, who is the publisher of Airship 27. When I met Ron, I went to um, the Pope Art Convention in the first Pope Art Convention, the first and only Pope Art Convention, and that's where we first met. And when we met, that was like 2000, I would say 12. I want to say 2011, 2012. But, you know, we sat down and we had a chance to talk, and he said, hey, have you ever heard of Bass Reeves? And I said, no, and he proceeded to tell me about him. Ron is a renowned comic book writer. He was the first comic book writer to work with Alex Ross. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And Ron has written what for many people is like the definitive Green Hornet comic book series. He wrote a comic, he wrote a Green Hornet comic book miniseries. And he is a fantastic human being. So now he's publishing pulp novels and anthologies through his own company, which he shares with his partner, Rob Davis, called Airship 27. And what happened was that after he told me about Bass Reeves, I thought, oh, my God, how come I've never heard of his character? And Ron said, well, I've been trying to interest comic book companies in doing a graphic novel about Bass Reeves for decades, and they're not interested in it. So what Ron finally did to make this story short is that he started publishing anthologies about Bass Reeves through his own company. And uh, he contacted me. He said, you want to do a Bass Reeves story? And I said, try and stop me. (laughs) <laughs> so to date I've written I, I wrote stories for the first two anthologies I missed the third and I'm going to have one in the fourth anthology which is going to be coming out this year we still have fictional stories about like Wyatt Earp and Annie Oakley and you know Billy the Kid and you know Bat Masterson and all these other western characters and it's criminal that more people don't know about Bass Reeves. I mean, we are getting to know more about him because he figured prominently in the Watchmen TV series. There was a Bass Reeves movie done last year, but it went straight to video. But he's a character that people should know about. And yeah, we should have a Bass Reeves day if for no other reason than to educate more people, especially black people, about him. What have you got coming out? How can uh, my fans find out more about you? You mentioned your website or websites earlier. If you could mention those again for me, uh, so people ha- so people know where to find you and how they can get in contact with you. Okay, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, contact me. The place to start at is fergusoninc dot com. That's that's my main website. That's the hub that will take you to everywhere else that I have a presence on the internet. There is a, I have a, another site that's just for Dylan and you can get a link on Ferguson Inc. and go there. You can get to the Ferguson Theater through there. You can get to my Facebook page on there. <laughs> you know, that's the place to go. If, if you want to start finding out more about me, I send everybody there. Ferguson Inc. That's the name of the site. And like I said, it's at fergusoninc.com. Once again, I would like to thank Mr. Derek Ferguson. And thank you, dear listener, for spending a little of your day with me. And thank you for the reviews because they are a huge help. And if you haven't done that yet, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download this episode. And please, 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 I'm begging you, please leave a review for us. It helps the show get seen by more eyes and we can have more people join the conversation. So until next time, see you. Hear it, speak it, live.